Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, a carcinoid cancer foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host, and I'm a filmmaker that's been working with the foundation for almost a decade now. And what we generally do is create video content, produced video, uh, as well as live series like Luncheon with the Experts that, that help spread awareness and education about neuroendocrine tumors. That is the mission of the foundation. And we, found, we have found that video is a super impactful, super powerful way to do that, and especially this live video. So we're really excited about this, this series, which has been going on for about half a year now, which is wild to, to think about, but we were really appreciative of everybody who joins us every week. And uh, if you are one of our regulars, you know what to do. Let us know in the comments where you're signing on from in the world. We love to see how far uh, these programs reach. That's one of the, um, the things that, that I'm most excited about is seeing people from different countries joining us live. So before we get started, we want to thank Tercera Therapeutics, our presenting sponsor for their support of the series. We wouldn't be able to do this without them. And a quick disclaimer that we say every week, the opinions expressed by the guest presenters as well as the questions asked by you all, the audience at home, have not been created or suggested by the sponsors of the program. And CCF doesn't endorse nor promote any of the views, opinions, or information, information expressed by the guest presenter. And audience members, again, that you all watching, should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health and treatments. Uh, so that last line is really the takeaway. We're going to give you some good information. We're going to give you some good direction and guidance today, but by no means do we know your specific case. And we certainly don't want you to make any, any decisions without talking to your home team that knows your case. So that is the takeaway. Just a reminder before we get started today, I'm really excited to have a, a friend of the foundation, a friend of mine that I've worked with several times before, Dr. Pamela Kuntz. How are you, Dr. Kuntz? I am great today. How are you, Rain? It's good to see you. I got to say before we get started, like what a professional Zoom background. You look like you've done this a few <laughs> times in the past year. Just <laughs> um, a few. <laughs> just a few, right. Uh, so for those who, who may not be aware of you and what you do, tell us a little bit about your role as you see it in the neuroendocrine tumor community. Great. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to be on this um, program with you. It's, I've been looking forward to it. Oh, and um, so I'm a, I'm a GI medical oncologist, and I specialize in care and research for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. And I've recently made the move, a big cross-country move from Stanford to Yale. I did that mid-pandemic in July. I guess we're still mid-pandemic. Right. Um, and uh, where I'm now leading the GI cancer program, um, but also really personally still focusing on the care of patients with NETS. When did, when did you first start working with neuroendocrine tumor patients specifically? Do you remember the, the first time? Well, I, I remember some of the um, beginnings of, of my interest in the field. So mm -hmm. I had a, a mentor ask me to help write a review article um, for, this, for professionals, for the scientific community mm -hmm. on neuroendocrine tumors um, when I was a fellow. So this was probably 2005, 2006. And at the time, this was really before a lot of our recent FDA approvals. And it was a really exciting time to get into the field. And um, the same mentor said, it's easier to become an expert in a rare disease. So I just kind of stuck with it. And um, the, I think as many who are listening today know, the community of net experts and physicians is a really tight, small community and we all are very supportive of each other and um, it's a tremendous network and I received lots of wonderful mentorship in that whole network and that's what kept me in it. And then I think from a patient care perspective, I really um, am so, I, I feel very grateful when I work with net patients. I feel that really all net experts have a lot to contribute because it is a rare disease and I feel that I'm really um, making an impact. Absolutely. And I, I'm excited to talk to you personally, because, you know, I've, I've, we've worked together. I did an interview with you and you were featured in some of the video series we've released over the past year. Um, and I, I really love your approach uh, and your stance and, and, and just what you were saying. I have to plus one that about the community. I think so many of the people that join us on the show 
join us for the information that's very clear, but also for, for that element, that aspect of community that we help kind of harbor. And that's for me personally, because I'm not a doctor or not a medical expert, that's the part that lights me up. And, and I know that it does you too. And to be honest, I don't, it's, I think we're fortunate because that's not super unique. A lot of the doctors, a lot of the experts that I talk to in this, in this community have that same, that same vibe, that same feeling of, of, being appreciative of the community and, and, and treating it as such and being really patient centric. I, I love all that stuff. Uh, for everybody listening, we, we are going to start taking your questions. You can go ahead and send them in uh, anytime. Uh, something I like to mention every week is if you see a question in the comment thread, I know a lot of times there's, there's conversations, side co conversations going on over there, which I highly encourage. I love that part of the show too. But if you see a question that someone asks uh, that you also have, or you'd also like the answer to, or to hear more about, go ahead and like that question or, or love it with the reaction buttons uh, right under it. You can, you can like the, or reply to the, to the question, but if you like it, it kind of upvotes it so I can see we get a lot of questions each each week. And so that lets me know there's a demand for that question. I can make sure that I get it across to Dr. Kuntz. But regardless, with respect to her time and your time, we may not get to everybody's questions. So I want to say that uh, if you don't get your question asked, if you have a follow up question or are seeking more information, always follow up with the foundation either here on the Facebook page, you can send them a private message or reach out to them at carsonoid.org, their website. Uh, before we get started, I want to ask, have you downloaded CCF's Net Cancer Health Storylines app? This app is awesome. It makes it really, really easy to record your symptoms, your medications, nutritional concerns, your moods and more. And so it's a really helpful way to, to, to navigate this as well. It's a great tool. So if you haven't, check it out. We will put the link um, in the comments. And to that point, uh, anytime Dr. Kuntz refers to something, if there's an article or a treatment or, a, a, you know, anything like that, uh, a resource that would help you, we're going to do our best to try to include that link in the comments so you don't have to like write that down or take notes or hop over to another, to a web browser and try to seek that out yourself. We're going to try to do all the hard work for you. Um, so Dr. Kuntz, we're getting some questions in already. We've got great numbers already, which is exciting. I told you, you were very popular. <laughs> um, Tell me a little bit about how long would you say you've been working with neuroendocrine tumor patients at this point? Probably about 15 years. 15 years. Okay. And I know that from talking to a lot of doctors that especially it seems in the past 10, there's been like major, major leaps forward in how we, we diagnose, how we treat this disease. And you, from your experience, what are some of the things that have really helped you take those leaps forward in, in, in your ability to serve your patients? Uh, there's so many. Um, <laughs> so, well, I think that, you know, one of the biggest things has been, um, I'll talk about two areas. One is the epidemiology or kind of defining the incidence of NETS. That, that's really critical. And then I'll talk a little bit about treatment and diagnostics. So I think one of the really key areas, is, there are, have been a, a number of epidemiologic studies that have really um, helped put nets on the map, so to speak, of really defining that these are indeed more of a public health problem than previously recognized. And I think until that point, um, this dates back to kind of around the time that I was getting into nets, a really key seminal article by Dr. James Yao and colleagues. He is at MD Anderson and really one of the pioneers in the field. And he and his colleagues um, did a review using a large national database that defined the incidence, so the number diagnosed per year of patients with NETS, and then also helped look at the prevalence, which is the number of people alive with NETS. And I like to compare those two things because I think though the incidence is low, right now it's about seven per 100,000 people in the United States mm -hmm. per year that are diagnosed. And, but the prevalence of so the number of people living with NETS in the US right now is more than that of pancreatic adenocarcinoma and stomach cancer combined. There are a number of factors with that, but I think that um, patients with NETS are in our communities, in our healthcare systems, many providers, primary care doctors, general oncologists will come across these. So I think this, these epidemiologic studies have done a really wonderful job of helping to start raising awareness. Mm -hmm. And then what has come with that 
is then a, an urgent need to do scientific studies. And I think the scientific community has really embraced that. So that includes large clinical trials, that includes studies to look at the biology of you know, why, we're, why patients are getting neuroendocrine tumors, what's the underlying molecular biology, and then also developing new diagnostic tools like the Gallium 68 Dota PET. So I think that really all has gone together. Now let's flip that coin over a little bit. What are the things, where are the, what are the areas that you still need uh, a lot more help in, in, in trying to, to get through or get past or achieve? Where, what are the, the rooms for opportunity and improvement? Still, still lots of opportunities. I think that, um, you know, there's still room to improve awareness and um, really across the board for, for, for the professional societies. And um, groups that I'm involved with are certainly trying to do that. We actually, this is good timing starting tomorrow. We have our big GI oncology professional society meeting. Sadly, it's all virtual like everything else these days. It's normally in San Francisco every year. It's called GI ASCO. ASCO is the American Society of Clinical Oncology and that's our largest oncology professional society. Um, so there's actually a panel on neuroendocrine tumors. So that's actually really exciting that the society gives some airtime to NETS. And um, I'll be speaking on that along with some of my other colleagues. So I think that's great. And that helps get the word out um, to general oncologists, gastroenterologists, um, surgical oncologists, et cetera. Um, in terms of sort of specific scientific needs, um, I think one of the most important scientific needs right now is, uh, is around, you know, how and when we use this new therapy, PRRT, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, the brand name. So that's a class of therapies, kind of like you would say chemotherapy. Sure. Um, the specific brand name for the agent that we use in the United States is called Ludothera. Its generic name is Ludotatate gets confusing because there are lots of different names to describe it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's been a really major advance. It was FDA approved exactly three years ago. And we now um, have a great tool, but are trying to learn more how to optimize its use. Who are the best patients suited for that? When should it be used in their course of therapy? Which patients may respond better than others? Which patients may not respond? Um, so we, I'm involved in another organization through the National Cancer Institute. We have task forces that are dedicated to studying specific diseases. So right now I am fortunate to be chairing the Neuroendocrine Tumor Task Force um, for, the, for the National Cancer Institute. And that, um, in that role, our committee helps set priorities for the United States-based clinical trials. So we are actually focusing a meeting coming up in the spring on treatment in the era of PRRT. So we're really trying to help answer those questions, but I think that kind of framing how we um, use PRRT and how we make it better is really important. Absolutely. We've, we've already got some questions uh, about that as well. And the questions are coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and, and pivot to some of those. Everybody, if you're just joining us, or if you joined us a little bit late, we this is Luncheon with the Experts. We are here today with our guest, Dr. Pamela Kuntz at, from Yale. Uh, if you can't tell already, she is a wealth of knowledge. But what I like, one of the things I like most about her, um, and I always encourage doctors to do this, some, some it's easier uh, for than others. Is, is the way she explains things uh, so that people like you and me probably can understand them. Um, but I really appreciate that. When we did some of the videos before Dr. Kuntz, that was something I really noticed about, about you. Uh, Dr. Kuntz mentioned PRRT. I will just say that um, we have a video out on that. If you go to the videos tab um, or the YouTube channel of Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, you can find that video on PRRT. The most recent one we released was uh, on lung nets and dip neck, another another area that's really popular. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start taking some questions from the audience. Uh, we've got some great numbers. So everybody, if you know anyone that would benefit from this one-on-one time effectively with Dr. Kuntz, tag them in the comments, share the video. Let's get some more people here. So Clinton says, welcome to Yale, where uh, Dr. Modlin, developer of the net test, is also based. 
Have you spoken with him about the net test? I'd like to know your thoughts on it. A lot of people also liked this comment and we get a question about the net test every week, it seems. So first part is, do, do you know uh, Dr. Modlin? Have you talked to him? And then secondly, <laughs> you're already laughing. Um, what are your thoughts? So yes, great. No, I do know Dr. Modlin. As I said before, the net community is small. I got a wonderful welcome email from him. I have not, I think with all of us in, sort of semi-quarantine. Sure. I have not met with him in person yet, but I have met him at prior meetings. But even virtually his personality shines. <laughs> <laughs> I love yes. that guy. Yes, exactly. No, and he and his team have certainly pioneered um, in the field for many years. And um, I think he's done quite a bit of work on the net test. And um, I think it's, there's, um, he's done had a lot of publications and I think we're all as a community still trying to figure out how to use it. It is not something that is currently standard practice. Right. And I think we're still learning how to incorporate that into our decision making. So I would say I'm not using it routinely. Um, I'm eager to see, I think it's going to be incorporated into some upcoming clinical trials and I'm eager to see some, some of those results. Yeah, I think that seems to be the consensus from what I can tell is that it's people are very interested in it, but it's it's pretty new and, and people uh, are have, you know, more questions about it would like to see it use more learn more about it, but it seems like there's a, a lot of interest behind it. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we talked about PRT. I've got a question from Tom that that says that he's had PRT and, and is asking about are there any additional treatments uh, in the pipeline that, that you see that, ex, that excite you, I'm adding this second part, that excites you the way PRRT did? So great, great question. Um, you know, I think there's some new forms of PRRT that are right. in clinical trials that I think are really exciting. Um, so ways that you can change PRRT, you can change the radioisotope. Mm -hmm. So the current treatment is with a radioisotope called lutetium-177. So there are some clinical trials using a radioisotope called LED-212, um, that's one. The other is changing um, whether or not you kind of turn on or off the receptor, that's called an antagonist or an agonist. So there, there are lots of ways that we can try to make this a little bit different. And in doing so, the hope is that maybe we find something that is a little bit more specific, maybe more effective, maybe lead to less toxicity. So those are some exciting things that are happening in the world of PRT. We're also looking at, should we be combining PRT with other therapies? Um, I think as a routine practice, that's not recommended right now until it's sure. formally studied in clinical trials. Um, you know, I, patients often ask about this and um, more is not always better. I think that we need to be thoughtful about how we combine therapies because sometimes they yield more toxicity and sure. more side effects, but not more benefit for patients. Great point. What about sequencing? Do you have a stance? Does it differ from patient to patient? And where does it fall uh, in, in the line of, of treatments? So sequencing is a really important practical question for the field right now. And I think we are fortunate where in the last decade, we have a whole bunch of new FDA approvals, but we don't know an optimal order with, with which to treat them. So when I meet a patient, I tell them that we really tailor it based on them. Mm -hmm. It depends on a number of factors. So it depends on their primary site, meaning where did the cancer start in their body? We now know we can't lump all nets together, that they do have some unique features. So lung nets may be different than a pancreatic net, may be different than a small bowel net. There's some overlapping um, drugs that we use that are effective, but there are some unique differences. It also may depend on whether they, you know, what their grade is. So grade one, two, or three nets are sometimes treated a little bit differently. Usually we'll lump grade one and two together and grade three will be treated very differently. So I think the easy way to answer that is that it's really tailored to the patient. So, yeah, it, 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 uh, it seems that, that a lot of things when it comes to treatment of nets come back to that, that general principle right there. Um, so I have a question from Karen about uh, amines in our food. I had no idea this. I had no idea this can cause carcinoid syndrome with palpitations. Can you can you tell us about your experience with this? 
So I think, um, you know, there are dietary um, amines and serotonin containing food and tryptophan containing food. And I think that um, this really applies. I might back up a little bit and just define okay. carcinoid syndrome and define functional Please. and non-functional nets. So for our, our listeners, um, another really key way that we categorize nets is whether they are functional or non-functional. Functional nets secrete a hormone that we can measure in the blood or the urine and cause symptoms specifically. And a non-functional net either doesn't secrete a hormone or it's not from, or their symptoms are not clearly from something that we can measure. And one of the most common functional nets is carcinoid syndrome. That's due to secretion of a hormone called serotonin. We can measure that in the urine as a 24 hour urine test. There is um, some emerging data that plasma urine or plasma 5-HIA is something that we may have more access to in the um, and may be effective way of measuring that. And um, so some patients with proven carcinoid syndrome, so I'd say this does not apply to everybody. So for those of you with a non-functional net, I don't think you need to worry about, you know, serotonin or amine containing food. But for folks with carcinoid syndrome, there can be some foods that serve as triggers for their symptoms. And these include things like um, nuts, cheeses, avocado, tomatoes, alcohol, caffeine. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to avoid these. It just means that you need to be careful and maybe keep a food diary and note which of these do cause those triggers. Can, can you talk for a moment about the difference in serotonin in the brain and serotonin in the gut? Is that a fair question to ask? I'm not, a lot of people know or have heard of serotonin, but I think sometimes it, get the, it gets conflated or they think it's necessarily the same. And I don't, it's not, right? Well, the hormone itself is similar, but sure. our body has a barrier. Um, I, I use, sorry, I use my hands a lot, but our body no, no, has no, a, please, a barrier. Visual cues. <laughs> <laughs> right, a barrier um, in the brain called the blood brain barrier. So the blood that's circulating in our body doesn't generally cross into the brain. So the serotonin in the brain that we all have heard is related to um, risk of depression, right. um, tends to not be related to the same serotonin that is, it can be secreted by these nets that have carcinoid syndrome. And um, it's a great question. It's something that's been worried about for a while in yeah. terms of our therapies. So as one example, there's a relatively new therapy called telotristat. Mm -hmm. It's a pill for patients with carcinoid syndrome that reduces carcinoid syndrome diarrhea. And in its studies, they specifically studied the risk of depression. And it ended up um, because this, this drug decreases the synthesis of serotonin in the body. So mm -hmm. the thought would be, does it cause or lead to depression? And mm -hmm. the answer is no. Okay. But it seems like it's, it's a discussion I see outside of the net community too a lot. So I was personally personally interested in that. Um, back to the questions from the audience. I have another question from Karen uh, who says, would you recommend genetic testing uh, to, to find what treatment would work best for you with this cancer? That's the complete question. But I think the bigger topic is, is genetic testing. Yes. Um, so it's probably worth defining what we mean by genetic testing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, genetic testing kind of is this umbrella term, but I actually think there are two types of genetic testing. So one is thinking about testing the genes that are passed from parent to child. So that is to look for inherited syndromes that may predispose patients to cancer. Mm -hmm. um, that's called germline genetic testing, and that can be done through the, a blood test or kind of a, um, a swab in your mouth, they get some cells off the um, inside of your cheek. And that is, um, I would say, not very common for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Some may have heard of these syndromes. I will list them just for the, for the listeners. So multiple endocrine neoplasia or MEN one and two can be associated with increased risk of neuroendocrine tumors and some others neurofibromatosis, von Hippel-Lindau, all of these can sometimes predispose patients to getting neuroendocrine tumors, but it's probably less than about 10% of patients with NETS have an inherited syndrome. I think the other type of genetic testing that this particular um, listener was referring to is when we test the tumor DNA. 
And the tumor DNA can sometimes give us some clues as to what types of treatments to use. I will say it's not been super helpful for nets. Um, low grade or grade one and two nets tend to not have a very high mutation rate. Um, and I think that we can sort that makes sense scientifically because many patients with nets have a more slow growing or indolent disease course. Um, and we tend to see higher mutation burden in patients that have more aggressive cancer. So that may be true for our grade three neuroendocrine carcinomas. Um, that being said, we will sometimes will get that genetic testing that's called somatic profiling. And there are a number of commercial companies and academic institutions that will do kind of a set panel of genes to test that are the most commonly mutated cancer genes. Got it. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I, everyone at home, I told you she was, she was thorough and explains <laughs> things very well. And I noticed that when you answered that question, you, you didn't see this, Dr. Kuntz, but uh, a lot of likes uh, flew oh, in. Good. Okay. But yeah, yeah. So for everybody at home, uh, I tend to say, I try to say this every week too. That's a really good visual cue. I'll convey it to, to Dr. Koontz, but it just lets us know that you're getting good value out of this and you're getting the answers that you're looking for. You can like, or love, you know, love the comment and let us know that that was helpful. Um, and now, and now they're coming in. See the, the call and response <laughs> to this audience is great. Um, here's a question from Arlene, which I think is important. Um, and it ties into the, to the family, the genetic uh, issues we were just talking about. If you have not been diagnosed, but suspect NETS because of a family member, and how can one steer a doctor in the right direction to do tests? So I think, I, I feel like the question is, if you're, if you're feeling like this, and this is a disease that many um, general physicians may not be super familiar with, or maybe they recall from, from school, how do you, it seems like to me, the question is, how do you advocate for yourself when you feel like, you know, maybe you've gotten the information or if you have a family member and you think that you'd like to, to get a test. And then the follow-up question is what kind of tests would you go to first? I guess that might depend on the symptoms, but what, what's your yeah. suggestion for Arlene? So if, um, if, if our listeners have a family member who has a neuroendocrine tumor, generally speaking, that um, the germline genetic testing starts with the individual who has the cancer. Mm -hmm. And so they, if they ended up being assessed that they do indeed have a genetic mutation that predisposes them to cancer, then we do generally recommend that family members get that same testing. And I think that then, um, you know, our listener can bring that information to their doctor. I will say though, in um, the absence of having a proven inherited risk, um, I think that I would probably not recommend just screening for cancer without having that proven inherited risk. Great, thank you. Hope that that, uh, that helps Arlene. Um, question from AG, AG says, please tell us about Yale's net department team approach. Great. Um, I will, I'm happy to talk about that. Having just arrived, I'm still working on developing the team, <laughs> but I will um, you know, speak to that just in general. I think yeah. that a multi multidisciplinary team approach for patients with NETS is critical. Um, what we do have at Yale and many places have our tumor boards where that's a perfect example of multidisciplinary team care. And um, in our gastrointestinal and neuroendocrine tumor clinics, we have team-based care. So a tumor board consists of um, medical oncologists like myself, surgical oncologists, um, radiation oncologists, nuclear medicine physicians, gastroenterologists, um, radiologists that look at the scans and pathologists, I'm probably forgetting people, but, but suffice it to say that lots of different disciplines, and I would say especially in this field, are really required to help make good decisions. And so when I tell patients, you know, I'm bringing your case to the tumor board, I want you to have full access to all of the experts at Yale. This is why we do it. And I think that that's critical. What about any non-doctor members that you think are important to have? Yes, absolutely. So, um, so in fact, actually just earlier, this is my week of um, lots of patient webinars. So I just spoke mm -hmm. to our net patient support group at Yale earlier this week. Um, and so that's run by our social worker, really important member of the team. Um, we have dietitians who are also critical members of the team. Um, we talked earlier about foods that can trigger carcinoid syndrome, patients who've had 
gastrointestinal surgeries often need help with a dietitian. And then in addition, we have nurses and nurse practitioners who are also really critical providers in the day-to-day -day care of our patients. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, I have a question from someone who seems like they may have, may have been a patient of yours in Stanford for Jack, who says formal, former grateful, <laughs> grateful Stanford patient. Yeah, there he goes. Terrific to see you. Man. Thanks for doing this um, question. What is the, what is the threshold for PRT for nets that have spread to the sacrum and liver and are slowly growing in the liver? Thanks for all your wonderful care and caring. Very nice. Thank you, Jack. Um, so, you know, PRRT is, um, let, let's talk a little bit about how, what it's approved for and maybe indications for treatment. So PRRT, the clinical trial that led to its approval was just for patients with small intestine nets. However, the United States FDA approval also includes pancreatic nets. So it's for patients with metastatic, pancreatic, or gastrointestinal nets. Now, that being said, um, many of us can also or have also treated patients with lung nets um, and unknown primary nets who and all of whom have metastatic disease. And the site of the metastatic disease doesn't matter so much if it's bone or if it's in the liver. PRT is a systemic treatment. It's infused through an IV. So it goes through your blood and it goes throughout your whole body. And so it goes to the sites that we can see, like in the bone or in the liver, and it goes to the sites that we can't see. And it's really on the basis of the fact that we know this treatment targets the somatostatin receptor, which is like a little flag that lives on the surface of, our, of the neuroendocrine tumor cells. And it knows to kind of hone in and attach to that receptor. And that's how the therapy is delivered. Got it. Thank you. Um... I have a question from Jackie. Um, Jackie, if this is your first time joining us, I want to say welcome. And I generally hold this question. I typically ask it, ask it at the at the end of the program. I think it's important because she kind of asks it. Jackie simply says, "I'm newly diagnosed and I'm freaking out." That that's that's the comment, and and I think that's important to 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 bring up because I don't think that that's unique to Jackie. I think often when, with any disease, but especially with this disease, which is rare, and there's not a lot of information. Hopefully, people like uh, like you and ourselves at the foundation are hel helping that. But I think that causes a lot of people to freak out, you know, when they don't know what this is. So my question is uh, based off of Jackie's concerns. What do you say to a patient that that is newly diagnosed and freaking out? Like, where do they start? Is it educating themselves? Is it calming down until they get a test? Is it, you know, like if someone's in that state, that mental state that you can be whenever you hear the word cancer, but especially when you hear rare cancer and you've never right. heard of it before, what does that person do? I think, um, I think it's a great question. So for Jackie and the other listeners who are newly diagnosed, and I would say really even our entire community, it's, a, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty throughout the entire journey of having a cancer diagnosis. And so those um, kind of moments of, you know, freak out or worry, you know, can happen throughout the course. So um, I do have some thoughts and some tips. I would say one is um, certainly you know, find yourself a both a community oncologist and or a neuroendocrine tumor expert that you um, trust. I think not all communities have access to a net expert, um, though one of the silver linings of COVID is that many of us are able to provide some access through um, telehealth. Um, so you have to ask certainly your, there are state-based rules and you can inquire about that. Um, but most communities have, have access to someone who is either a GI medical oncologist or a lung oncologist, depending on your primary site, who can assist. And I would say start there. There are also some fabulous organizations like CCF and, and others that have resource pages that are trusted resources. I would um, recommend against just a blind Google search because I think that with rare diseases, um, you can kind of find yourself down a rabbit hole without really knowing if that information is trusted. So rely on some of those like key net organizations. 
And then I would say, you know, it's this is a um, it's it's a journey, and and I don't know um, the specifics, but I would say for most patients with nets, specifically with the grade one and two, um, it's a long journey, and it's kind of wrapping your head around finding that team that feels like a good fit. And then I think knowing, you know, one message I want to get across today, Rain and I have talked a little bit about already, but it's an entire a really hopeful and optimistic time um, for NETS. I think that we've made incredible advances over the last decade in terms of new treatments and new imaging, and um, there are ongoing clinical trials. So for me, that that's honestly why I do both patient care and research. That research, um, you know, is motivating for me, yeah. and I can share that with patients, and, and that's a, a big feedback loop that I think is um, Hopefully I can impart that to everybody. Absolutely. Thank you, Jackie, uh, for your comment and sending you love and, and strength. And if you are new to the show, again, I want to say welcome. And I encourage you to, to come back. We're here every week. We're here for you to help you with, with information and guidance that you might need. But also, I'm not a medical expert. So um, I, I know that we provide such great information, but the secondary thing, I would even say it's it's on equal level that we provide with this show and at the foundation is the community aspect. And I can't, I, we touched on this already, Dr. Koontz, and I can't reinforce that or reiterate that enough that the the community here is so strong, so supportive, and, and it exists right here in this show. So uh, come back uh, next episode every week if you can. And the people that, that are here and talking in the comments, like they, they will help give you guidance too. So just know that we are, uh, we're here for you. Um, so moving right along, Dr. Coons, we have a lot of questions about PRRT, which we've talked about, you know, today already at, at length. And uh, I think that's a good, good thing because people are, are asking about it. Um, John says, to what extent does PRRT affect blood platelets? So, so good question. Um, so PRRT and actually many of our other systemic treatments that include chemotherapies and even some of the um, biologic therapies like Affinitor and Sutent, they, you know, have um, their goal is to attack cancer cells, but they can have some collateral damage on normal cells. And some of the cells that are most susceptible are cells that are rapidly dividing in our body. That includes red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And so specifically to answer the question about PRRT, it can um, sometimes affect these cells that are made in our bone marrow. And it has to do with the radiation's direct effect on making these cells in the bone marrow. Um, it tends to, for most of these, be a cumulative response. So it may not happen with that first cycle of PRRT. It may happen over time. And often patients with their fourth and final cycle of PRT may have some low blood counts. Sometimes we need to make adjustments to doses to get people through all their, all their treatments. We may need to delay a dose, and sometimes we even need to omit a dose. Um, but know that your, your team usually is being very thoughtful about that, and we honestly don't know if four, if that's the magic number of number of cycles of PRT. That's actually a question that we're trying to look at. Sure. Could two be enough? Um, but platelets can be affected. That's monitored regularly throughout your treatment. Got it. What about vein health? We had a, a, a question from Trudy about that. She says, for example, since my first treatment, first PRT treatment, uh, I now have discomfort in my legs that seems to be varicose veins uh, issues returning. So any thoughts on that? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, to my knowledge, that's not directly related to PRRT. Okay. So um, without knowing more specifics, I probably can't can't address that. Got it. Um, I have... I have a question from Clinton that I, I, I like. I'm interested in this. Uh, he says, please describe what your day is like. Uh, <laughs> patients, how many patients do you see? Research, what subjects, reading, keeping up with industry papers. What's a typical day, if there's a typical day, uh, in the life of Dr. Pamela Koontz? That's a great question. Um, 
Well, I, I can talk about this week a little bit. So I'm sure. working from home today. Um, I'm happy to share. I have um, a physician husband and three sons. So um, I actually was just texting one of them to stop playing the piano while I was doing my <laughs> online webinar. So, um, so, you know, we all have the same work from home challenges that everybody does. For sure. um, yesterday, I had a full day of clinic and I did half in person and half by video visits. This is something, you know, I think also um, initially during the beginning of COVID, I think was a real challenge for the medical community to shift to telehealth. It was really overdue, frankly. And I yeah. think that there are um, some real opportunities to use telehealth in a positive way. Not every patient I think is right for telehealth. Um, mm -hmm. So my in-person patients yesterday were patients getting started on new treatment. So I had a new patient for PRRT, another new patient that was starting on Cape Tem, Cape Cytobine and Temozolamide. And um, so the treatment patients I usually try to see in person, I'll see a lot of my new patients by telehealth that allows their family members and kids to participate if they want that's to. Point, and I think yeah. that's actually a real treat. And um, just since having arrived at Yale, I have a big administrative task <laughs> to build a GI cancer program that includes NETS. And so um, much of my day is administrative in terms of meetings to try to really build and grow this program. And um, I'm trying to think of what else, research meetings. So I lead the research team there for GI and NETS. And we talk about what clinical trials we have, what patients are on our trials. And, um, you know, I love being in academic medicine. It's a little bit, it's really varied. Every day mm -hmm. is different and I love the variety. And, um, and then I, I teach um, not really in a formal didactic way but I had a meeting this morning with one of our fellows. She's actually gonna help me write a review paper on neuroendocrine tumors. So I'm trying to teach the next generation. Nice. And um, I love doing that too. Awesome. So if that sounds a little chaotic, it is. But, yeah, no doubt. But yeah. I, but I really enjoy it. With the program that you're building, what's your timeline on that? Is there is there a deadline or one you're? Um, well, so I'm. We are in the process of um, building out kind of a leadership structure for the GI mm -hmm. cancer program at Yale, and also individual disease specific programs. So I'll okay. be helping to lead the neuroendocrine tumor program um, with one of my colleagues in nuclear medicine and. Um, you know, this is, we're hoping to announce this in the next few weeks, actually. Awesome. So isn't you're that exciting? To, you're you're to, all sworn to secrecy. Yeah. We won't tell anybody. <laughs> I can't speak for the hundreds of people watching. I won't tell anybody. Is that, right. That's gotta be exciting, right? To, Super for, exciting. To yeah. And, like and I think, you know, a lot of people have asked me, you know, do I like, cause that's when I was at Stanford, I, um, had a role where I led the neuroendocrine tumor program, but I did mm -hmm. not have that broader hat. Um, and so I don't want the net patients to worry that I'm forgetting them. I'm not, and that's still no, you're doing this for my them. love, but, but, I, but it really, I think will help me have broader impact yeah. and is really exciting for the GI cancer community as a whole. Absolutely. No, I see that as, as a hundred percent, uh, being in, in, of service to your community. I mean, totally, yeah. this helps you have a, a more profound impact by far. It's the yeah. ripple effect, right? I mean, you're, you're putting together a, a an all-star team. It sounds like for, them. I <laughs> oh, I have no doubt. Um, all right. Here's the topical question from Bridget. Uh, let's talk COVID vaccine. Um, do you recommend net patients? And uh, it seems like she also experiences or has carcinoid syndrome to get the, the COVID vaccine. So excellent, very timely question. Mm -hmm. And um, so I can, I can speak to the vaccine a little bit. So I'd say that the healthcare system and your sort of community practice and hospitals are be, are safe, but also becoming safer. So most physicians, patient facing physicians will have had at least their first vaccine I have by now. Um, I'm getting my second one in I think about 10 days. Um, so in terms of patients, um, we, we kind of the oncology community are all advocating that our cancer patients be considered early in this vaccine rollout. Um, and Rain, I can send you a link, but ASCO just put out, they put out a statement a few weeks ago about this, about advocating for access to vaccines and okay. having cancer patients early in this kind of rollout. Um, the question around, so I'd say, yes, <laughs> we, net, net patients are included in that cancer community. 
Um, some states, in fact, we in the state of Connecticut just got an email this morning that they are um, you know, starting the rollout for people over the age of 75, just right, the general solid. community. And so I'm, and hopefully we'll lower that to 65 at some point soon. So I think that our community at large um, will start getting access, which is really exciting. And um, I know my 80 year old mother is getting her vaccine today, her first year, her first vaccine. So I'm excited about awesome, that. Awesome, awesome. And, but in terms of this question around carcinoid syndrome and safety, um, yeah. the reason this listener raised this is that um, I'm guessing reading between the lines because I've been asked this before. If there happens to be an allergic reaction, mm. one of our most common ways to treat an allergic reaction is with epinephrine. Mm -hmm. And patients with carcinoid syndrome are generally told to avoid use of epinephrine because it can trigger a carcinoid crisis. I would say this is all about balancing risk and benefit. So if someone with carcinoid syndrome truly has a life-threatening allergic reaction, it's safer to get the epinephrine than to not get it. Um, now, that being said, the risk of an allergy from this vaccine is incredibly low. I think it's being quoted as like less than 0.4%. So it's, um, it's a safe vaccine. I think that that risk is low, but certainly talk with your medical provider about it if you have something specific that you're worried about. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And thank you for your question. Um, still back in the PRT space, we have a question from Glenda, which I don't think we've touched on. Um, what are the common side effects of PRT? Common side effects of PRT, yes. So um, I would say probably the most, let's talk about them in terms of acute side effects. So ones that may happen immediately or while you're getting the treatment and then maybe delayed or long-term side effects. So immediately, I'll just talk about kind of some of the logistics. Patients need two IVs. So it's, uh, you know, having two IVs in, you can have some arm pain. And sometimes I thought actually your earlier question about vein health, patients need to have actually pretty good veins to have two IVs every two point. months. Mm -hmm. um, and um, sometimes patients can have a little bit of nausea on the day of treatment that has gotten lots better um, as we have used a new amino acid formulation. So amino acids are given as an infusion in one of the IVs and the lutathera is given in the other IV. And the reason we give amino acids is to help protect the kidneys. It helps the kidneys, um, it prevents the kidneys from taking up the radioactive particle. And amino acids, if we all remember back to our high school biology, are building blocks for proteins. And they, it's, think of it like hydration, uh, just extra hydration. And Got so that, those amino acids can cause nausea. We give anti-nausea medicines on that day. We give you some to take home if needed, but generally that nausea doesn't last so long. Um, we, the earlier question about lowering of blood counts is something that we monitor for. And that can happen as early as the first cycle, but we usually see that as a cumulative effect. The other side effect that can be cumulative is fatigue. And that's the most, probably the most common side effect with any form of radiation, whether it's external beam radiation, like the type of radiation where you lay on a table and they aim a beam to treat maybe a bone metastasis. But this form of PRT radiation can cause fatigue too. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, everybody, we've got just a little bit more than 10 minutes left. This is Luncheon with the Experts with Dr. Pamela Kuntz. Um, so get your questions in and I have a question from somebody I'm going to get to and touch base on, um, but she missed the first half. Cheryl, if you did just know, and this goes for everybody listening, if you want to refer back to this, or if you missed the first half, this video will be evergreen. It'll live right here on the Facebook page under the videos tab. And starting Monday, we republish it to YouTube, uh, uh the YouTube channel of Carcinoid Cancer Foundation. If someone else, you know, doesn't have Facebook, they can also, uh, view the material there. Um, so yeah, we have 10 minutes left. I'm trying to get through all the questions and it seems like I'm almost caught up with everybody. Uh, Dr. Kuntz, nobody tell her this, but her numbers are sky high today, which puts her in the top <laughs> percent, which makes her officially a rock star status <laughs> of the luncheon with the experts series. So obviously there was a big demand to talk to you today. I knew there would be, you're knocking it out of the park. We have 12 minutes left. Let's keep moving forward. Cheryl asked about the net test. So Cheryl and anybody else who might've missed that, we did touch on that already. 
And I just wanted to to mention that uh, the first episode of Lunch with the Experts was with Dr. Modlin. So we have a whole episode on the net test. This comes up every week. Um, it's, I don't know, Dr. Kuntz, if controversial is the right word, that might be too strong of a word, but it is a topic of discussion currently. I think I can say that's, that. That's much. a good way to put that's it. That's a better yeah. way to put it, right? Um, so people are interested though. There's a, there's a high amount of interest, but people are also maybe not skeptical, but just need to know more information. So it's, that's it exactly is something, right. yeah, it is something very interesting right now. And I, I'm going to be interested to see, uh, the future, the future of this. Um, Okay. Let's see. Da, 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 da. What do you are right, what um let's see, don't freak out. Would taking uh would taking this is a vaccine question again, would taking an emergency shot of octreotide prior to the vaccine be appropriate? Does that make sense? That probably, yeah, it probably depends on the on the individual patient. I think depending on um, how serious the symptoms are from their carcinoid syndrome. I'd say probably talk to your treating oncologist about that. Okay. Um, we it seems like we've had a lot of people interested about the vaccine. So Fred, who's a top fan of the foundation, says thanks for removing some of our worries about the COVID vaccine. So I'm glad that helped, Fred. Um, right. Ruby says, can PRT cause high blood pressure or high blood sugar during treatment? That, that's a good question and maybe worth addressing in kind of a broad way. So sure. these, um, so somatostatin analogs, which is the class that describes octreotide and lanreotide, um, and really anything that targets the somatostatin receptor like PRRT, mm -hmm. um, can affect your blood sugar or glucose metabolism in your body. I would say the most common is high blood sugar, though some patients will have kind of varying blood sugars. And so that is something to talk to your, both your treating oncologist about. Sometimes we need to include an endocrinologist as part of that team if your blood sugars are super high, um, but it is something that can happen as a side effect. Got it, thank you. Sandra says, can you talk about uh, uh, autonomic issues with NETS? I don't know that I understand the question. I don't, right. I don't either, that's why I kind of pause. Autonomic? Yeah. Autonomic, did I mispronounce that? Autonomic. Um, I mean, I can address that in general. I'm not sure I have a, a, a lot to say on that. I, and, okay. and again, may not know exactly what her, yeah, yeah. What her question is getting at. Um, so autonomic problems in general, I'll just define that as a medical term, often refer to kind of um, dizziness or lightheadedness or neurologic mm. changes okay. and can those happen with neuroendocrine tumors it has to do with the nervous system got it, got um it. so neuroendocrine tumors neuro have that you know neurologic in them and have cool. endocrine in it because of um secretion of hormones so it does include and involve this like neuro and endocrine systems um to my knowledge we don't see a lot of um, like known autonomic dysfunction in patients with neuroendocrine tumors. I think that really what we follow are if someone has a functional neuroendocrine tumor, sometimes those hormones can cause symptoms that may um, cause dizziness or lightheadedness. So again, it's very specific to the patient. Uh, yeah, she chimed in uh, as we were saying that it says autonomic uh, dysautonomia. <laughs> <Sorry>. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what, what does that mean? Do you know? So that it means just sort of dysregulation of dysregulation. that of that system. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Uh, I, I was laughing about something else. I saw a question from Donna says, do I see a tiny RBG on the shelf in the background? Indeed. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> um, are there symptoms? This is from Mary. Are there symptoms of carcinoid syndrome other than the typical flushing and diarrhea? That's the ones. Yes, we there are. There are a few others. So, um, Sometimes serotonin can cause wheezing or asthma-like symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, that's one. And this isn't really a symptom, but is a finding that can be associated with excess serotonin, which is fibrosis or scarring. That can happen on the valves of the heart. That can, so that's sometimes why we monitor and get echocardiograms. And then also can sometimes happen in the abdomen. So there can be some scar tissue that develops around tumor sites. And that's just, it's something that serotonin causes and something that we often will monitor for. 
And we, we've talked a lot today, Dr. Coons, about PRT. That's, that's been a topic that seems to have come back a lot. Uh, and I know that you were excited about <clears throat> different um, versions of that or, or different elements of PRT. Are there any other treatments or things that you know about that are coming down the pipeline that, uh, that also have you excited besides PRT just getting, getting better? Yeah, there's um, so one of the things I'm talking about this weekend at GI ASCO, I'll mention, and I just recently wrote a, re a review article on this, is a new drug that was just studied in two large clinical trials in China called surufatinib. Hmm. And to my knowledge, it doesn't have a brand name that's easier to pronounce yet. <laughs> so, um, but, um, and I'll remind our audience that anything that ends in an IB like sunitinib or right. serufatinib um, are a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. That's a class of therapies. They're usually pills and they usually target these tyrosine kinases that could have a variety of roles in the body. But the ones that work for NETS end up targeting things like the blood vessel pathway or um, other pathways involved with tumor growth. So this new drug, serufatinib, um, was... Um, had, there were two positive phase three studies in China. It was then subsequently studied in the US in a phase one, two study that looked at and proved, proved that it was safe and early efficacy in a United States population. And so this is now sitting with the FDA for a decision. So this is, um, so we're eager to hear what the FDA's decision is. I don't have any inside scoop on that, but that could potentially be a new drug that's available. And it was studied in all nets. So. Um, lung, GI, pancreas, unknown primary. Got it. Uh, Randy says, this has been great. I love the non-medical speak and, and explanations. Thank you, Dr. Kuntz and Carson Cancer Foundation. I, I, ha I have to, to agree. Um, when you're dealing with patients, how important is that to you to, to, to help put this in language that they can understand? Um, it matters so much. And I, and it's something that is not always um, natural for doctors, I will say. Fair, fair point. And um, it's not something we're not taught in medical school necessarily oh, how to so do that. Point. And um, it's something I work really hard at. And I, over the years, have, I think, gotten better at it. But I pay very careful attention to it. I think words really matter. I talk to my trainees a lot about that. And yes. and and And... One of my um, good friends and colleagues who's active on Twitter, if any of you follow her, Tatiana Prowl is a um, medical oncologist. She's a breast medical oncologist. Um, she works at the NIH and also at Johns Hopkins, but she also is a really big advocate for using the right words. Mm -hmm. And words um, have a lot of meaning as we talk both about medical diagnoses, but about as we talk about bad news and as we use totally. the right language to describe race and gender. And I mean, everything, words really matter. Yeah. I'm so, I'm so glad that, that, uh, that you said that. I'm glad that, that, that I asked that question and I, and I kind of, I know your stance on how you feel about that, but I think it's important to talk about and, and the more we, you know, I've learned about it from, from studying the way, you know, we process emotions is, is, you know, certain words, words impact you neurologically, just in the same way that physical pain does. And I think so often in the medical industry and in life in general, we, we try to scoot past that and just, you know, and, you know, the old like sticks and stones break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's just not true. Right. Um, the words you choose are important. They do matter. And I'm glad that you included that to let's kind of flip that around a little bit to a patient who's dealing with a doctor who's maybe not as experienced or hasn't put in that work that you have. And then maybe they're talking on a high level. Um, what would you suggest or advise that patient to do to get them to slow it down? Is it to, you know, be more diligent with their doctor? Is it to bring in someone else to help, you know, how can they navigate that if they're finding themselves dealing with, with uh, uh, someone who's talking to, to them in a way they can't really latch on to? You know, there are probably a few different ways. One is just kind of asking them to repeat it. Say, you know what, I didn't really get that. Could Simple. you repeat yeah. it again in words that I can maybe understand? Yeah, I, um, bet, I bet if you ask them to repeat it too, naturally they'll try to rephrase it in a way. Exactly. No. Yeah, exactly. I'd say always bringing a friend is okay. Okay by me, no. <laughs> um, whether it's a family member or a friend that's just another set of ears. 
Um, patients ask a lot of the times, can they record the conversation? Usually totally fine by me. And then patients can go back and listen to it again. And um, I think just providing a forum where um, what I try to do is where it's okay to ask questions. Yeah. And so, and, and then some of it's really fit. So I'd say try all those tools, but I think ultimately if you, you know, have a provider that maybe you're not connecting with or not communicating well with, there are other providers to, to try. <laughs> That's a fair point too. Uh, and you mentioned earlier about t the telehealth, uh, allowing more people to kind of be on that call and maybe the families. I think that probably is, is, is another tool in that toolbox of having people there that, that might not have been able to join you, especially now uh, in person exactly. that can help you with that. It, it, you know, when we were talking about how doctors talk, it reminded me, my mom's in real estate and she used to she talks often about the different types of home inspectors uh, when you're, when you're, when they're walking through, when you're trying to get your loan and some of them are just like, dun, 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 like, this is terrible. You, this is, this is bad for your house. Or you have others that are more eloquent. They're like, okay, well, this should be, you know, attended to at some point. Here's the, you know, here's the pros, here's the cons, here's how you should do it. And just that, the way you deliver that information is so, is so important. Um, basically, uh, we are at the end of the show. Dr. Kuntz, we've got about a minute left. Any parting words for those uh, patients out there that have joined us today? Well, first off, I really want to thank you and Grace for the invitation. This has been really a lot of fun and I hope educational. And um, again, I want to leave the group with a lot of hope. I'm hopeful for the future of um, kind of treatment and new discoveries in this disease. And um, I think they should be too. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for, for saying that. And it's been a pleasure. I was excited. We were excited at the foundation to have you on here. And I'm, I'm really grateful that you joined us today. Happy to. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. And thanks to, to you all joining us at home. We hope the program helped as always answer some of your questions. And if you have further questions, reach out to CCF at carsonoy.org or send them a message here on the Facebook page. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. Without them, this program wouldn't be possible. My name is Rain Bennett. Thank you for watching and please join us next time on Luncheon with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.